A year ago, a group of Republican political consultants came together with a common mission. Help defeat Donald Trump and fight the toxic Trumpism that was poisoning our country. We believed it was a time for choosing country over party. We called our efforts the Lincoln Project. Over the last year, we have been joined by hundreds of thousands of like-minded citizens eager to put aside political differences to unite behind the fight for the soul of our great country. We believed this was a basic choice, Trump or America. On November 3rd, America won. But in the days since, much of the Republican Party, the party of Abraham Lincoln, has turned against democracy. For the first time in our history, the majority of a major party attempted to overthrow the results of a presidential election. Their sedition failed, but they will try again. The battle for America's future is just beginning. It is our turn to defend democracy. Those before us did not flinch. One battle is over, but the long fight for what it means to be an American is just beginning. In the days ahead, the Lincoln Project will find common cause with defenders of freedom and decency everywhere. There are more of us than of them. This is the country we love. We will win. Join us. Good evening and welcome to The Breakdown and happy anniversary to The Lincoln Project. We are 34 days away from the inauguration. It is the last night of Hanukkah, so happy Hanukkah to all of our Jewish brethren out there celebrating. And like I said, it is the one year anniversary of the Lincoln Project and we have a special show for you tonight where we're going to talk all about it and reflect on the last year, the ups, the downs, the good, the bad, all of everything in between, all about what we've do done over the last year with the Lincoln Project. So stay tuned. We have some of your Lincoln Project favorites with us tonight. Uh, we have Stu Stevens, Reed Galen, Jennifer Horn, and of course, the great Rick, Rick Wilson. I am Tara Setmayer. <laughs> There's the Rick Wilson, and we are your hosts for the evening. Um, as always, we want to hear from you, so please send us your tweets at hashtag AskTheBreakdown, and we will try to get to some of your tweets throughout the show, where you can ask some of our, our co-founders and, um, and folks who are intimately involved in the Lincoln Project some questions that you've been burning, burning desire to, to ask those questions about things and how they've gone over the last year. Um, you know, Rick, it's uh, it's got to be surreal for you, you know, as someone who's been there from the beginning, that a lot has happened in the last year, you know? I mean, we'll get into this a little bit more as the show goes on, but um, what are your initial thoughts when you look at that video and you think, oh my God, that was a year ago? You know, I tweeted this this morning, Tara. I have two big emotions. First off is enormous gratitude for the millions and millions of Americans uh, who supported us, who encouraged us, who donated to the Lincoln Project because they knew we would put the, those donations into the fight right away, um, to the millions and millions of Americans out there who were looking for a, a place to go that wasn't Trumpism and who were looking for a way to fight that wasn't the same old, same old. And so that gratitude I feel for all those people that came out and have, have sent us not just today, but throughout this this battle, the most encouraging and heartfelt uh, wishes, you know, for, for our success. It has been something that is just enormously moving, and and the and the second emotion that I'm feeling right now is determination, because as you saw mm -hmm. in that video, this is a fight that's not over. 
you know, we knew that Donald Trump would be tough to beat, and he was tough to beat. We played our part in beating him. We're proud of that. We also knew that Trumpism was more pernicious, and now we know how pernicious. We know there are 70 million Americans in the thrall of an ideology and a philosophy that is profoundly dangerous to the future of this country. And so the mission that we're on uh, continues. The work we have ahead of us is significant. And, and, and so you know, that, that first feeling of gratitude and, and, and just d being so honored by the trust and, and faith and support of so many people, um, it really means a lot to me personally, and I know to everyone else in the Lincoln Project. Um, and that Absol determination absolutely. is something that, that no one should mistake the fact that we got Donald Trump out of office meant that our mission was over. We said it very clearly last year in that op-ed that the, the mission of the Lincoln Project was to eliminate Trump and Trumpism and its enablers. That's a That's long right. road ahead, folks, uh, but we're here for it. Indeed, and uh, you know, for, for someone like myself who was also there pretty early on, yeah. it's been remarkable to, to watch what this has become and the movement it's become, and it's been an incredible honor to, to uh, fight this fight with you guys. And we'll get into that a little bit um, when we bring in Reed and Stu and Jen. Um, but as you talk about that Trumpism hasn't been defeated and you're still determined, it's one of your, your emotions when you think about everything that's happened in the last year. You know, January 6th is coming. You know, we've had a bunch of benchmarks throughout this, this whole ordeal, you know, with, sure. starting with uh, the uh, election on November 3rd, and then we had the, you know, the Safe Harbor Day, then we had the Electoral College certifications, and we thought, okay, finally this thing is over. But no, there's one more date that we still need to pay attention to, and that's January 6th when the new Congress comes in and accepts the ceremonial um, process of the accepting the electoral vote certification of the winner of the, of the presidency, Joe Biden. And we are hearing that there will be some shenanigans pulled by some more intransigent Republicans to try to protest this election. The absurdity of this is off the charts. We are really at a point now where the Republican Party has become more anti-democratic by the day, trying to overturn an election that was clearly lost by Donald Trump. There was no massive fraud. Um, we're like teetering on authoritarianism here, and it's, um, it's quite a sight to behold. Uh, you know, Mike Pence, as the vice president, will preside over this this um, ceremony on January 6th. And, you know, this will formalize Joe Biden becoming the next president. Uh, I'm very curious to see how he handles this. Joe Biden was in that same position four years ago um, when, he, when they handed the reins over to Donald Trump. Um, every vice president prior, you know, in recent memory has done this without incident. You know, you, know, you have a couple people that, that objected in 2016, but nothing to the extent that we're, we're, be, we're being told that some of these Republicans are going to try, and the fact that they they need a senator to co-sign this so they can have a vote and then throw this whole thing into chaos, you know, I mean, you never know. You never know. Will they overturn this? No, but it will be another day that I think will embarrass the Republican Party and damage the the long-term legacy of of the party even more than it already has. It's shamed itself uh, terribly up until this point, and I think January sixth is another one of those days where uh, we're going to see. Um, <clears throat> further damage to the Republican Party as they try to um, overturn a free and fair election. I never thought I'd ever see that day. Uh, we're also hearing that Mike Pence is going to jet out of town after that. So he probably will do the right thing, right? He doesn't want to hear it. He doesn't want to, he doesn't want to hear any shit from, from President <laughs> Trump. He's out of here. He's got a ticket. He's going to, to the Middle East. He's like, yeah, they can't touch me if I'm overseas. So by the time this blows over, it'll be safe for me to come back. Trump won't be president anymore, by, I guess. By, I don't know. January, no January, by, by January 21st, Mike Pence and mother are going to be buck naked <laughs> on the beach in Pattaya, Thailand, just chilling out, <laughs> ripping balls on ecstasy. It's going to be awesome. I, that's an image. <laughs> that's, that's an image that You're I welcome. don't ever <laughs> want to see. And something tells me that I don't think Mike Pence and mother have ever been fully naked ever together anywhere with any lights on. So I, I don't think we're going to see them on anybody's speech. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, Rick, I believe that there has been a poll going on uh, that we want to make sure that our, our folks have been involved in, right? There has been. We asked about four of the biggest ads we did, and uh, folks loved Flag of Treason. Uh, ran a quick Twitter poll this afternoon, and Flag of Treason. Turned out to be, I'm shocked. It, it just scooted past 
you know, Morning in America and Covita. But, uh, you know, and Covita is one of my personal favorite ads I've ever made or seen uh, yeah. because it just caught such a great moment from the, from the moment that Steve and Reed and Stuart and I were on the phone, like, what do we do about this crap? Yeah, <laughs> to, that was a good one. Having an opera singer actually rip it perfectly. But let's, I think we've got, I think the studio guys have got some, uh, some, some spots to roll here. Yeah, in, in a second, I just want to say something about the Flag of Treason ad. Um, that was one of the ads that I, I had some input on and was very yes, proud to did. be a part of that. And um, I'm very pleased very to see that that, in that. Yeah. that that ad uh, was, a, was a fan favorite. And um, that ad also had a lot of impact that I don't know of, if a lot of people know that. Um, you know, you were telling me about at, right at the time that Flag of Treason came out. And this wasn't this was just pure co coincidence, really. Is when the I, the the discussion about the uh, Confederacy and and Confederate names of bases and NASCAR mm -hmm. the Confederate flag it was all around that same time and Rick you shared with me that that had some impact that ad had some impact in those decisions which is uh, which goes speaks volumes mm -hmm. right about the, the power we, of we we heard from folks we heard from folks in the senior military leadership we heard from folks in NASCAR and 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 the NCAA who were all saying. This was a catalyzing message. This was something that, that you know, the, before that ad hit and before we, we got the president talking about this issue on our terms, no one really wanted to tackle it. After that ad, the Marine Corps, the Navy, Army, the Air Force, the NCAA and NASCAR all said, no more Confederate flags in our facilities, in our bases, in our, in our, in our events. We're done. No more Confederate flags. We're done with this. And we are very proud of the fact that that catalyzed a moment, we think. And of course, when you've got the NCAA, NASCAR, Mississippi, and the military services far to the left of Donald Trump on the issue of the yeah. Confederate flag, you know, you know you caught or at least played a role in a historic moment. And we're very proud yeah. of that. And it also really shaped a lot of the uh, perception of a lot of the Republican and independent voters, which Jennifer Horn will talk about later, I'm sure. That was one thing that made them make a choice. You know, do you stick right. with Trump and these people, or do you move on? That's right. That's right. So That's um, was, that was a it was that was a remarkable ad. And and Nate Nesbitt and I wrote a co-wrote an a, an op-ed that was published in yes, CNN on how no Republican group had ever taken that issue on the way Lincoln Project did, and it forced people to to have to. Uh, confront something, a very ugly history that Donald Trump was continuing to push out there in ways that we had not seen since, you know, the, the, the 50s and Bull Connor and um, George Wallace and those folks. Right. And so, um, right. so yeah, so that's a flag of treason. We appreciate you guys voting on that. So you talked about Jennifer Horn. Let's bring in our guests for tonight, including Jennifer Horn. We've got Stu Stevens and Reed Galen. They are part of our Lincoln Project co-founders, brethren, key players in this whole operation. Uh, welcome back, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Happy anniversary. Yes, happy anniversary. We should have we should have had beverages for this. People used to look forward to our Friday shows because we would drink on those. Oh, there. You, well, yes, but that doesn't count, Rick. Unless there's some rum. Best I can do tonight. <laughs> um. Let's take a look back at the war, how the world looked, how it looked before the Lincoln Project began. We'll talk about it on the other side. Harken back, if you will, to the yesteryear of last year, December 17th, 2019. A more innocent time, vibrant with commerce, travel, and physical contact. Filthy life-threatening physical contact. In this bustling tableau of a forgotten time, Americans wander naked-faced through the naked streets with not a care in the world, except the continuing loss of their democracy. Here, a typical couple eats indoors with abandon. Watch them as they discuss plans to see family at Christmas. Even Grandma will be there with her new boyfriend, Meanwhile, the nation waits with bated breath for the Senate impeachment trial of President Donald J. Trump. Eagerly, they wonder how many Republicans will finally speak their conscience. Surely two or three. 
Reflecting on the gravity of the situation, the imperiled president offers these words. You want to see a bird graveyard? You just go, take a look. A bird graveyard? Go under a windmill someday. For their part, the Dems are certain that whoever their nominee is, he or she stands a good chance of blowing it. Well, all but one, Joseph Robinette Biden. Yes, old Joe's campaign is surely dead in the water, and the media has sailed on, seized with the euphoria of the latest craze, Buttigieg mania. Elsewhere, at the failing New York Times, an op-ed penned by four die-hard never-Trumpers is raising quite the rumpus. They're vowing to defeat the president who they call dangerous and corrupt. They call themselves the Lincoln Project. What will the next months bring? Folly? Fiasco? A global pandemic? There is just no way to know. But one truth lingers. There can be only one winner. America or Trump. Oh, the good old days of yesteryear prior to Lincoln Project, like, you know, BC before <laughs> Christ, we should have time, LP, before, BLP, before Lincoln Project. Um, Jennifer, you were there at the big Cooper Union event when everybody was on stage and it was kind of the, the debut after the, the op-ed had been written. It was the, the first debut of, of, the, of the Lincoln Project. And... Um, since then, you have uh, played an instrumental role, obviously, in, in everything that Lincoln Project has done. But you also made a really big decision and an announcement today to leave the Republican Party. Uh, what was the last straw for you? Well, Tara, first, it's great to be with you and Rick, especially on this really important day, this first anniversary. And I'm so pleased that I get to be here with Reed and Stewart as well. Um, and I also have to say my very favorite word in that little piece you just ran was rumpus. I, I, I'm glad that we're all <laughs> causing the rumpus. That's it. it reminds me of my grandmother. Um, but you, you know, it, it, it was very clear to me through, through this whole thing, I have been a Republican that, that kept hope, I guess, that when this was all over and Donald Trump was in the rearview mirror, that somewhere there might be some Republicans ready to come forward and try to rebuild on those principles and those values you know, the, of, of the party of Lincoln that, that drew all of us uh, to the Republican Party at one point in our lives or another. And it became clear to me in the last four weeks, post-election, it's not Donald Trump that caused me to leave the party. It's all the other Republicans out there, those 126 members of Congress, the silent senators in the, in the Senate majority, um, the, the attorney general, the, all the, the thousands of, of Republicans on the ground who all actively embraced the idea that they should overturn a legitimately elected uh, uh, government in the United States of America. The assault on democracy, the undermining of the Constitution, it became obvious to me, Tara, in the last four weeks that the Republican Party as we know it, the Republican leaders that we have in this party today, don't want to return to a day of principle. They are choosing to build on Trumpism as their strategy to go forward, even though Donald Trump lost the White House. And it's just, it's simply not a position that I can embrace or be part of. I hear you, sister. I was exactly where you were you. The, day, the day after the election for the exact same reason. Donald Trump didn't drive me out of the Republican Party. Right. It was all the collaborators, the enablers, all of the people who sold out who were supposed to be the guardrails. You know, they were right. supposed to be the ones that yell stop athwart history and they did not. And once it, I mean, there was, you know, obviously <laughs> many reasons um, it builds to be up, upset with it? Republicans. Right. Yeah, but once you attack the, the most in fundamental institution of our democracy, free and fair elections, and you sit back and you allow that to happen, enough was enough was enough. It, there was no right. coming back from that. And um, so when I saw sure. you had made that decision and that was your reason, I, I cheered you on and said, that's right. Mm -hmm. And you know what it looks like, how we change this moving forward, we're also figuring that out, but it clearly won't right. be with an R next to our names, you know? Um, right. I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, because I know you have, uh, you have, you have a, a hard out in a couple minutes. What were some of the highlights for, for you throughout this experience over the last year that things that stood out to you where you were like, where you said yes during this entire, this, this entire ordeal? 
<laughs> right, right. And there are definitely days when it felt like an ordeal. Um, I would yeah. say that the high <laughs> moments for me uh, were started with being at Cooper Union, standing on that stage at the podium, the same podium that Abraham Lincoln stood at. And Reed and Rick can speak to this. The original leather is still on that podium to stand there with your hand on the leather where it's worn and torn and look out in the audience and realize, oh my God, like this is, this is it. This is the real thing. This is the real deal. That was really a powerful moment for me. Um, Morning in America, it was my favorite ad. And I think that was a real powerful moment for the movement that Lincoln Project became. I think it was an ad, you know, and, and all the credit goes to Rick and his creative team that he ran through this whole operation. That was a really powerful moment where I think the American people looked at that ad and saw the truth. And it spoke to the heartache and the loss and the burden that the American people were beginning to bear under the, over the loss of, uh, under COVID-19. And I think it was the first time that people looked at us and said, you know, something's happening there. This, I, I want to be part of this. I want to be, I got to get it. I got it. I want, you know, this is, they're speaking to me. They're speaking to my heart. Um, and, and then probably the only other big one, the big yes uh, moment was when I was sitting on an Amtrak train going through the Rockies on the Saturday after, uh, after the election. And every news outlet, every credible organization in America called it for Joe Biden. That, that was really for me that, you know, uh, and as for everybody, I suppose, but there was something really powerful in that moment. And I thought about everybody who was part of it, every person who's going to be on your show tonight, all the folks that, you know, um, and, and, and because I know I, I'm not going to get a chance to come back and say a lot, I want to say thank you um, to, you know, the, the, the other founders on this, uh, on this, uh, of this whole organization, Reed and Rick and Steve. Like they had the vision. They, they knew what needed to be done and how to do it. And the rest of us got to come on board and be part of that. Um, it, it really has been a great honor for me to have been part of this. And I'm excited looking forward, knowing what the possibilities are for what we can achieve in the future. Well, thank Amen. you so much for sharing that. That's, um, You're here. You, know, I, you know, I think people, it's important for the supporters of the Lincoln Project to see the people behind this operation and to, you know, I think some folks feel like they know us because of, you know, uh, Jennifer has her show on LPTV as well. We always promote the sister show and they get to, they get a feeling of like they know us, but then, but then, you know, they, there are others behind the scenes who they don't see as often. Right. And it, it is truly a, a, a team effort and uh, we're, we're a better team with you on it, Jennifer. So thank you for thank everything. You. Welcome to Thank the you, land Jennifer. of the politically homeless. It's okay. Yeah. And, you know, we're, we're, we're more powerful for it. Yeah, I feel really good where I am right now, Tara. I, I, I am very too. much at peace. So thanks <laughs> to all of you. I hope you guys have a great show tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, thanks Jennifer. Jennifer. Soon. Great. And like I said, don't forget to check out her show on Thursdays and I think at 2.30. Yes. Yep. Um, so, gentlemen, now it's just us. Uh, Reed, I'm going to start with you. That op-ed that you wrote a year ago, one of the co-authors on that, um, what led up to that moment? A lot of people ask, how the hell did this thing start? What made you guys finally say, that's it, we've got to do something about it, we're starting the Lincoln Project? Well, you know, it, it, the, there was a series of phone calls, and I remember walking around my driveway talking to Rick and, and John, uh, you know, who is, who is still on the mend and, and Steve and, you know, we're all sort of, um, fighters by nature in our own way. Right. And, and none of us, maybe the reason we dis dislike authoritarian, some authoritarianism so much is that none of us really like authority to begin with. So, um, <laughs> what I would say is that, um, you know, I remember sitting and sure, I'm sure Rick and Tara and, and Stuart, you, you sat in so many of these, you know, people's very nice dining rooms and, you know, boardrooms and hotels and everything else about how are we going to take Trump out? We've got to make him look like a loser and, and all these other things. And I said, you know, guys, I, I wish it was going to be that easy, but you know, it's like, we're going to have to fight. Like we're going to have to get down there with him and, and do to him what he does to others. Oh, no, no, we can't do that. We can't sink to his level. You know, if we do that, then we're just as bad as he is. And I said, well, that's, that's just not the case. 
Um, no one can be as bad as he is. Um, but I would say that, you know, the idea of, you know, the rule of law and all the sort of things that we believe in our hearts and are true, just bounce off of him, right? He just doesn't care. Um, and and fr frankly, his most diehard people don't care either. And so we, we made a decision, you know, last fall, the fall of 2019, to say, okay, we're going to go do this differently. Um, but if we're going to do it, we've got to be all in. And, you know, so we started writing the op-ed um, that was a team effort for sure. And it sure. came down to a point where we had to make a decision about where we, I guess, and, I, and Rick can speak to this as, as much as I can. I had a belief that in that moment in time, it was very difficult to be anti-Trump, but not anti-Republican, if that makes right. sense. Or at yep. least opposed to Republicans in office because so many of them, were, and, and as, as the little, as the, as the video showed at the top, this was pre-COVID, this was pre-impeachment, right? The economy was good. There was nothing that said that any of this was gonna work, um, but that didn't matter, right? And at we the time it looked like on. Bernie Sanders might be the nominee. Right, <laughs> right. Yep. right, yeah, right. It was, yeah, this was a duel between Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, and how were we going to square that There's uh, warning. You know, up against, up against Donald Trump? And, and so I think it all came together. Um, I knew something was going on. I had created a budget that had us raising $25,000 in the two weeks between the launch and the end of the year. Um, I thought that was it, and I didn't know how much we were going to raise. We raised about $400,000 in the first 24 hours, and, and we knew we had something. Um, and we sort of dipped our toe into the water during impeachment, and then we went to the Cooper Union at their invitation, again, as Jennifer noted. Um, but it was really, um, once COVID hit, you know, we found the gear. Um, and I think that it, yeah. it really, unfortunately, has cost the lives of hundreds of thousands of Americans. Um, but what we saw was that it also illustrated, I think, for America, really, just what a failure Donald Trump was. And once, you know, we were in that gear... Uh, you know, as, as General Jepp said, you know, you grab him by the belt and you never let him go. And that's that's how we operated from then until this very moment. Or as Rick Wilson would say, you put your foot on their on the neck and don't let up until it's uh, until it's over. <laughs> um, I, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of not letting letting bad guys off the mat ever. That's right. That's right. And that and that's exactly what we did. We there was no uh you know pulling back. There was no oh it's covid or oh Donald Trump has covid. We have to get the hell out of here. That's where covid came from. There was no I remember there, you getting a take call. your foot off the gas. You know, Jennifer, I remember getting a call the night it was announced that Trump had covid from a very 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 serious senior reporter and this person asked me, "So you guys are going to take it you guys are gonna pull back and take time off now to let mm. him recover and and i said are you out of your mind we're already <laughs> gonna hit him and it's coming tomorrow because yep. you know this is the kind of thing that that as reed said it's the general J thing from from vietnam you know we were beaten by exhaustion because the Viet Cong held us by the belt hit us a few times ran back in the jungle over and over and over again we couldn't outdo Donald Trump's billion plus dollar budget. We couldn't ever run as many TV ads or, 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 or do as many digital ads as they could. But what we could do was use a scalpel on his ego and his, and his, his consciousness and, his, and his, his peace of mind that he had a good campaign. What we could do is get his campaign manager fired, wreck his messaging over and over again, get him to chase the rabbit of our distractions over and over again. And so it, it really was one of those things. The style of fighting that we took into this was very different from a lot of our Democratic friends, you know, who thought they were gonna make it a policy argument against Donald Trump, which, you know, that we knew from the start, this is a character argument and this is a psychological argument. So- 100% and, from, from and, the very beginning. And Tara, may I just say, you just, just quickly, you asked Jennifer, you know, what, what her favorite moment was. And let me just tell you why I thought this was such an incredible team. Um, one of the things that we got so much mileage out of last summer was when Trump sort of shuffled down the ramp at West Point. Oh, yes. And uh, <laughs> yeah. Keith Edwards, who was our social media guru, who's moved on to greener pastures in Georgia, um, saw the video and he tweeted, Trump is not well. The hashtag Trump is not well. And it took off. He didn't ask us. He didn't say, what do you think? He just went and did it. And it went trending in a heartbeat and Trump responded to it. 
So then, of course, we get the Rick gets the crew together, and before you know, it, we've got a video. And he spent literally the next three weeks, you know, talking about the ramp, and the rest of the summer talking about his mental capacity to be present, right? And that all started because one young guy uh, had the sort of initiative and the freedom, I think, to go like say, I'm going to go do this, and it caught fire. And so, you know, I think some of the stuff we did uh, was a matter of luck. Obviously, we had incredible timing. But I think it was the it was the freedom to move and the creativity uh, to do the things we needed to do that I think made, you know, was a large part of the success. Obviously, Stuart and Rick had so much to do with, the, with that on the creative side. But just, you know, we, we're not micromanagers by nature. Right. We, we you know, operated much more like an octopus with nine brains. Right. The brains all did what they needed to do to do their jobs. And the octopus ate, you know, plenty well every night. You know, that's actually a, that's a good segue into a, a reminder of kind of um, how this really took off it, even before what, uh, Keith tweeting out that uh, Trump is on, not well or Trump is unwell uh, hashtag that blew up. And um, I, when I was drinking water, I was making fun of Trump drinking the water because that was the other part where he spent 15 minutes at that rally in Tulsa demonstrating right. to people how he could walk up and down a ramp and he could drink water. And it was, uh, well, and the you know, dramatic it, throwing of the glass yeah, off the stage. Yes. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Good God. Um, let's, let's roll <laughs> a little bit of morning in America, which was the ad that really, really put Lincoln project on the map. Um, let's go ahead and roll a little bit of that. There's morning in America. Today, more than 175,000 Americans have died from a deadly virus Donald Trump ignored, praising China's response instead of heeding the warnings, then blaming them to cover his own failures. With the economy in shambles, more than 30 million Americans are out of work. There's mourning in America. Today, more than 175,000 Americans have died. So, Rick, um, I know this was uh, this was one of your uh, prized possession ads there. And um, just talk a little bit about what made you decide to do that. And then I'm going to bring Stu in since he's a, a veteran of five presidential elections. And um, this is uh, this is a rehash of a Ronald Reagan ad. So just talk a little bit quickly about that. And then I'll bring in Stu. You know, Tara, I was I was just reminded of something. That was a second iteration of the ad that they just played. The first version, we thought it was shocking at the time, but the first version said over sixty thousand Americans have died of COVID. Right. And we that. thought at the time that was an absolutely horrific number, that it was shocking and appalling and and so far below what this country deserved from from a from a presidential leadership in a time of a pandemic. <clears throat> but you know, that version said 175,000. Well, 200,000 more people have died since then. And, you know, that this ad, yes, it's, a, it's, it's, it's an homage to the classic Hal Reine, Morning in America, Ronald Reagan 1984 ad. But it inverts the concept completely. Um, and it, and it, the reason the, the original Morning in America ad was so powerful was it caught an emotional moment in the country where there was a sense of rising optimism. There was a mm -hmm. sense that good things were happening. There was a sense that it was morning in America and that and that people's lives were improving. This ad caught morning in America with a U um, at a moment where they felt the economic uncertainty that was rising. They felt the, the isolation that COVID was starting to, to bring into their lives. They felt the losses that were accumulating every day. And so, you know, our team, uh, you know, Ben Howe and and Stuart Reed and, and John and, and Steve and I, we all talked this ad through very thoroughly, making sure it was it was tuned to precision, um, both visually and in terms of the pacing and the visual style and, 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 and the voiceover, so that it was a weapon very carefully deployed against a group of Republican voters and against a group of folks who had been Republicans and, now, and then were leaning independent to move them off of Trump. You know, I, I say this a lot. There were a couple of big families of ads. There were the psychological army of one ads that got into Trump's head. There were these persuasion ads that drew the contrast of, you know, Trump's talk to what was really happening in the country. And there were the ads that were wedging people out of the Trump GOP. Flag of Treason, perfect example. 
know, that was a choice. You watch that ad and you think, I'm going to be with Trump and these guys with the Confederate flag and the guy who's reenacting kneeling on George Floyd's neck. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be with those mm -hmm. people. Hell no. So, right. But this was an ad that we, we were very proud of. And it, 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 it also had state versions that got a lot of mileage in, the, in various states like Ohio and Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. Um, and we're just, you know, we feel like it caught a real moment. We're very proud of the response that it got. Stu Stevens, um, welcome. And uh, your, your creative genius uh, was certainly um, involved in a lot of these major ads. And uh, For sure. when the idea of Morning in America came up and they, you, you guys put it together, uh, did you expect it to have the impact that it had? And um, out of all the ads, which one was your favorite? Oh, look, uh, uh, Rick and, and the crowd really gets all the credit for Morning in America. Uh, I think it's a brilliant ad. I think it's brilliantly edited. And I think Rick's right. It really caught a, a moment there. Um, you know, I, I really, I, I don't have a favorite ad in all of this. Um, well, one of the things I think that, that I'm glad we did um, was we did some positive ads about Joe Biden. Um, because I really think that the Biden campaign doesn't get enough credit. Um, I think they ran an extraordinarily good campaign. It's, it's very difficult when you start out as a front runner and stumble like they did, not to try to remake the candidacy. Um, it usually doesn't work, hardly ever works, but it's sort of like being down in the Super Bowl, you know, 40 to nothing at the end of the third quarter, and you're going to stick with your game plan. It's hard to do. And they did, and damn it, they didn't win. And I thought that they showed tremendous discipline. Um, so one of the, the positives, I think, about what we were able to do is, you know, we didn't have a client. And that's very liberating. It's the first time I've ever really had that experience. Because in a campaign, if you go out and you call somebody, a, your opponent a liar in, the, in an ad, and the candidate gets ads, you know, is your opponent a liar? The candidate's got to say yes. We didn't have to worry about it. Um, I mean, we could get up in the morning, talk about what we we're going to do, and just go do it. Um, and, and that, I think, uh, worked well in this because we were able to do some stuff that the Biden campaign uh, really probably shouldn't have done even and helped shape the dialogue. Um, it's incredibly difficult to beat an incumbent president. Uh, particularly now that we don't have a federal funding system. You know, from 76 to uh, the Obama campaign in 2008, both nominees uh, got the same amount of money. And that did a lot of things. It helped clean up money. It was the post-war to get reform. But it also leveled the playing field. I and mean, if you have both candidates getting the same amount of money, and under that system, uh, Carter lost and Bush lost in 92. But now we don't have federal funding. So it's sort of a fair question to ask, when was the last incumbent president who lost, who wasn't in the federal funding system? And that was Herbert Hoover, and now Donald Trump. And with, with Trump, he really had someone who was trying to use the full power of the government uh, without any ethics, without any scruples, um, right. in a way that I think is sort of underappreciated here. So. Um, to get more votes than any president's ever gotten, uh, it's really an extraordinary achievement. I mean, I, I think the Lincoln Project was part of, I think it really su was successful because it was part of a much larger movement. Um, and I think that's just going to continue. I think the urgency of all of this uh, is, is really greater today than it was on November 2nd. I mean, I never would have imagined. I mean, I, you know, I wrote a pretty bleak book about the Republican Party. It's all a lie. You did. But I was, way, I was way over optimistic. I really, I mean, I show how naive I am or maybe how much I still want to believe. But I never would have imagined that what happened the last six weeks had happened. I mean, it's I the know. first time we've ever had a, a party uh, try to overthrow an election. Um, and I think the ramifications of this, how it's going to affect us going forward, and the necessity for an ongoing uh, Lincoln project is just is, is as profound or more profound than it was when Trump was in office. 
Yeah. I think, and I let, think me just, let me just say this. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead yeah. Me. And let me just say this, Terry. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's, there's all this talk now that, that Trump will, you know, announce his re reelection campaign on the day of the inaugural. Um, you know, I wouldn't, I mean, I would expect that he will for two reasons. One, because it keeps him in the middle of the crowd among Republicans, which he loves. And two, um, he gets to keep spending other people's money, which he think I think is the only thing he loves more than number one. Um, <laughs> it, but what the practical effect of that will be is that it will hold a lot of these Republicans, you know, whether or not it's senators, congressmen, governors, statewide office holders, you know, legislators, whoever it is, in place because they don't want to get outside his shadow. And I think that every day that that goes on and these people either act with continued complicity or continue to stand by silently, I think is not only more damaging to the Republican Party if such a thing is possible, but continues to degrade the democratic system because it moves the, it moves the GOP further and further away from whatever moorings it once had. Uh, that could be a year, that could be 18 months, it could be two years, who knows? So however long Trump wants to keep up the antics, uh, you know, maybe he'll run for re-election at 24. I don't know. He'll be damn near 80 by then. But, um, you know, I think that that the, the the Trumpism piece is not gone because not only will Trump not be gone, but because so many of these people, as Stuart described, slid so easily into that mindset and seemed to be really comfortable there. It's unbelievable. The, the, and the people who have done it, it's so obvious, the hypocrisy. It's so, you know, from the Marco Rubios to the Lindsey Grahams and and everybody else in between, Ted Cruz, and you know, you just look at these guys, and it's like, how do you look at yourselves in the mirror after what you said in 2016? Um, and then it got not only were they right in their characterizations of Donald Trump and their warnings about what would happen if he became president, they became enablers of it, and it's happened, and they're continuing to enable. When they had an exit ramp, you know, they all had an exit ramp after Trump decided not to accept the election and move forward with this absurd uh, voter fraud nonsense undermining democracy. They could have said, listen, we like his policies, but nothing is more important than the Constitution and our free and fair elections, enough is enough. They could have, and what have they done? They've gone completely off the rails and continued to enable this. And it's, uh, it's a sad state of affairs and infuriating to watch these people. Like, I, Anytime Marco Rubio tweets out another Bible verse, I just want to tell him to shut the F up. Like, just shut up, Marco Rubio. Lil Marco is going to go through some things in the next couple of years. <laughs> uh, uh, as, I, as, somebody, I, as somebody referred to him today, and I can't get it out of my head, somebody called him Micro Rubio. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And his little uh, fancy boots. Oh, my, oh, oh my, oh, my. <laughs> Stay tuned, uh, folks. Um, Apparently, Abe has some, uh, <laughs> has some things coming. Go ahead, Stu. You know, I've kind of come to a different conclusion about these people um, than I had before. Before, I thought it was that they were afraid of Donald Trump and that it was just from this cowardness that they were acting. And I think that's still a factor. I think, I think it's larger than that. I think that, mm -hmm. that this authoritarian streak that is inside the party is something that they, they feel comfortable to express something that they really feel. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think that these people are, it's not just that they're afraid of Trump, they, they identify with Trump. And to go as far as they did, I mean, you just think about it, for the first time now since Reconstruction, we're going to have a large percentage of the country who believes that we have an illegally elected uh, president, largely because of black people. I mean, that, really all of this voter fraud stuff is about right. racism. Because when he talks about illegal votes, I mean, he just says it. You know, it's wherever black people live in concentrations and vote. And You're right. it, it's- Not enough people it, make it, that it, point, too. Not enough people yeah, point that out. It, it's, you know, it, it, the party has become a white grievance party. But to really, I mean, they're not even saying that three-fifths can vote. They don't want any of them to vote if they don't vote for Trump. Right. Right. I mean, that's what the Texas lawsuit tried to do was disqualify exactly right. millions of African American voters at every at every voters, but but particularly African American voters in places like Detroit and places like Philadelphia and 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 places like Milwaukee. And that they wanted those votes thrown out. 
Well, let's be clear. Greg Abbott, the governor of Texas, did that, right? The the Fifth yeah. Circuit Court of Appeals, Federal Circuit Court of Appeals, upheld his decision, yeah. right, to have one drop box in Harris County, Texas, where right. Houston is, which is probably a county of three, four, five million people. I don't know what it is exactly. Right, it's about it's the size enormous. of Belgium. Right, and yes, yeah. um, and you know, probably has more population than thirty states or something. Um, but you know, I'm Tara. I'm uh, I'm listening to a book right now called Eichmann in Jerusalem, not to get too heavy, but about Adolf Eichmann's trial uh, as, mm-hmm. as one of the architects of, of the Holocaust. And the one thing that Hannah Arendt, uh, the, the author states, is that the, things that the thing that the Nazis had done most systematically to the German people was destroy any sense of morality, that there yes. was no sense of right or wrong anymore. And I think that you're mm-hmm. seeing that, and to, to echo Stu's point, is I think you're seeing that, which is Trump has has erased any sense of morality, not only among elected Republicans, but along, among so many of his supporters, too. Um, and I think that you see the Boogaloo Boys or the Proud Boys or any of them. And then, as I like to tell the story of the guy in Southern California in the blacked out $125,000 Range Rover with the Don't Tread on Me sticker anymore, who's like laughing at the, at the Biden supporters, right? Like he's given them license to be assholes anytime and all the time. Uh, and that's a that again, that is you don't have to talk about morality in the context of, of your personal life or anything like that. There are objectively good and bad ways to act as part of a society or as an individual. And Trump has really made all of that, and a lot of it, go away for the people who most support him. Yep. Well, you no, know, Reed, that's, that's, a, that's a great point. And um, I'm being told that we have someone that wants to say Merry Christmas, and it's Tiki. Tiki has uh, decided to come say Merry Christmas. <laughs> Tiki is dressed for the season. Yes, yeah, he's, he's dressed for the occasion. <laughs> he's gonna he's gonna co-host the rest of the show with me. But um, all <laughs> um, I had to lighten it up. I had to lighten it up. Thank We're you. Talking about Thank I you. I know. I it we had to lighten it up. It Tiki I'm showed sorry. up. But you know what else? That's why they don't let me on camera very often, Tara. Yeah, <laughs> no, you know, but it was an important point to make because it's 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 real. Reads Nick in the also, sunshine. <laughs> yeah, <That's right. laughs> uh, but I'm also hearing that we have someone on the line. Um, the president of the United States has just called in to the Lincoln Project and wants to wants to be a part of this Oof. conversation. Melania, um, take everything out of those boxes and put them back. We're not going anywhere. Hello, who's there? First uh, off, not only are the president Boogie Trump. Boys. Uh, yes, I have the book. Excuse me. I have the Boogie Boys. I've had the poor boys. They're going to stand up. They're going to stand back. They're going to stand down. And they're doing the hokey pokey. And that's what it's all about, folks. That's what it's all about. Is that what it's all about? Uh, We got the president here with us. Uh, What do you, what, so don't you have something better to do than to call us here at the Lincoln Project? Like, you know, talk to the Russians about hacking us? What are you doing watching TV? Excuse me, Terry. We're both from Queens. And I know that you got that Queens attitude. And I'll tell you, I'm not taking it. <laughs> I was born there, but I'm from Jersey. Go yeah, ahead. Sh- it's once you can't take the Queens out of anybody. Trust me, I've tried <laughs> surgically, surgically. <laughs> and I'll tell you this. I talked to Vladimir, but he says, no hack. There's no hack. And let me tell you, with the beauty of horseshoe politics now is Putin says there's no hack. Glenn Greenwald says there's no hack. So there's no hack. And everybody agrees. Everyone agrees. Listen, so they have access to a couple of nuclear weapons. How much more dangerous can it be than me having access to them? <laughs> uh, I think Rick Wilson totally th- right. has something to say to you that uh, uh, that thinks that's a little bit more dangerous, right? Rick, don't you want to talk to the president? I'm sure, you have a couple of things you'd like to say. Go ahead. This say is a delightful moment for me, Tara. You know, I, I just, I'm is. just curious if you agree with my theory, sir, that everything Trump touches dies. Uh, well, it was true for my mother and for everyone else, oh. that, for everyone else that I met. It's okay. We can be dark. I will always say something worse than, than anyone else did. First off, <laughs> yes, it's true. I have I have the Didus touch. Anything I touch immediately withers and dies. And we see this with the United States. I mean, this is so true when we think about it, because I said I had a little television show I did. Uh, I used to do fireside chats and they would introduce me as the 45th and final president. And I think it's true, folks. I think it's true. And Rick, the other day you slipped up on the MSNBC and you called it the Lincoln party. 
But guess what, buddy? You did it yesterday because I was watching. You said Lincoln Party, but you meant the Lincoln Project. And I'll tell you why. Because the Patriot Party, which was announced today, an incredible thing filled with General Flynn and QAnon and all the great people. The Patriot Party is coming. Yeah, sure, they're registered as a socialist party from the 1960s. But what's the details? Details, details. It's just like the voting. It doesn't matter. Rick, Wilson, Jennifer, all of you left the party. Steve Schmidt's a Democrat about Schmidt. And yet, when we look at the military, so tough. We rebuilt the military, the ships, the planes, the missiles, the rockets, all of it, the catapults, the hot oil, and we're putting the hot oil, KFC oil, the Kentucky fried chicken oil, the hottest oil you've ever seen. And we're going to pour it all over the ants of the thugs who are coming. I don't care if I have to dig a moat and pour oil on them. I'm going to do it. We had no bullets. Excuse me. We had no bullets when I took over. We had one guy with a rubber band and they called him the rubber band man. Yes, he was. He was. And now we have a tippy toppy military. Uh, okay. Donald, now I'll let you say something. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, soon to Excuse be ex-president Trump. Um, uh, if you Never. get this voter fraud thing and you you get to stay in the White House, are you going to make your son like the secretary of, of defense or something like that since he likes to shoot big guns? Excuse me. First off, Don Jr. couldn't be the secretary of his own underpants. OK, we're certainly not putting him in charge of anything else. This guy is one Coke nugget away from, from having a massive heart attack on Instagram. I mean, listen, my son, I slapped him silly. We went to a Yankee game. I remember I showed up and I knocked on the dorm room door and there was dumb Don the scourge of my existence. Why couldn't we stop with that hottie Ivanka? But we had to have Dawn. And Dawn opens the door in his sweatpants and goes, oh, dad, finally, we're going to have some father-son time. And I slapped him open palm and said, put on a suit. We're sitting with the Steinbrenners. And he did. And he's never forgiven me. And someday, you watch, Don Jr. is going to go down for everything that I did. Watch. It'll happen. I will put it all on my son. That'll be one of the great moments when you realize that I'm such a duplicitous psychopath that I will throw my own children under the bus, but never Ivanka. There's still a chance for a beautiful marriage. <laughs> uh, I don't know why you, you asked me to come on here. <laughs> you slapped on. Was that the last Man. time? Was that the last physical activity you actually engaged in? Well, uh, no, there. Well, it depends on what you mean in physical engagement. If you mean hiring people to stalk former sex workers in the parking lots of Las Vegas hotels, I consider that effort work. I have to pick up a phone. I have to move my mouth. That means that my fat and my neck is getting some work. So I lost a lot of I lost a lot of weight ordering various threatening near hits on people who have encountered me and have refused my extortion attempts. Tara, may I ask the president a question? Sure. You can fire uh, away, pal. You can't be worse than kill me. Uh, well, that is for sure. Um, but Mr. Trump, I, I read this, this week that uh, your neighbors at Mar-a-Lago Mar don't want you back. Uh, and they say that you're by law uh, not allowed to live there. So where will you find yourself uh, laying your head at night if, uh, if it won't be at your palace there in Palm Beach? First off, legally, legally, I can go to Mar-a-Lago for 21 days and then I have to leave and come back. That's the rule, the law, which has never been enforced in 20 years. I read the same article and let me tell you, you don't know 21 read, days, excuse me, I had Baron yelling at me through a screen <laughs> door, but because we don't let Baron in the same room as me. But the point is, I uh, 21 days and then I leave for a day, 21 blackjack. And then you're gone for a day. And you know what I do? I stay at Epstein's estate because I have a spare uh. key. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 Stu Stevens, I think uh, you have something to say to, uh, to uh, the, the, the soon to be former president. Don't you still? Nope, you're, no way. Oh, you're uh, not dragging. Yeah. It's going to be Ruby Ridge, baby. <laughs> yeah, but I, 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 Ruby Ridge. I just wanted to, I wanted to congratulate you because I understand that the next Mrs. Thank Trump you. just graduated from high school somewhere in Eastern Europe. It's a big That's day. Right.
Yes, thank you. Uh, I already I have four different. I actually have four different photos I'm perusing over right now. Excellent. Are you going to be able to afford oh, Melania's divorce settlement since you're broke and owe four hundred and twenty million dollars to Russian oligarchs around the world? No. Uh, excuse me. Who do you think left the back door hack open? I just made like twenty thousand Bitcoin. Are you kidding me? I'm totally about the crypto <laughs> now, man. I'm all about the crypto. But wait a minute. I'm sorry. I feel like Stuart didn't get his full question out. Stuart. Well, I was just wondering. Um, is it? really going to be such a relief not to have uh, another uh, Christmas in the White House with this woman who thinks that it's, uh, she's just like, uh, fucking get over it uh, when she fuck talks about Christmas. Christmas. That was the card yeah. Melania gave me this year. It just said, fuck Christmas. And it was a, it was a photograph <laughs> of, it was a photograph of her. And let's just say my toothbrush was not in a good place. But the point is, and excuse me, let me tell you this, excuse me. Christmas, first off, I love the Bible. I love both Corinthians. I think they're incredible. And their leather is out of this world. And the book of Job, what an incredible thing that Jobs is in the Bible. Everyone talks about Jobs. I did more Jobs than anybody. And Job, this guy, he couldn't get a break. He's dirty. He's filthy. His kids don't like him. His friends don't like him. He's got warts and sores all over him. He goes, God, why? Why? And he goes, give him a job. And I did. And that Bible, so let me tell you, the only thing about that Bible is the Jesus guy, very boring, very boring, wants to help everybody. You know, I have to say, I'm very anti-Christ. I'm very anti-Christ. <laughs> well, uh, on that note, uh, I guess we can say that there is someone who is more of a victim than you are, Donald Trump, uh, the losing president of this election cycle. Thank you so much for joining us. Excuse me. I want to say, first off, not a Merry Christmas to anybody. You're going to have to pry me out of there with a forklift. It's going to be like one of those old 700-pound person loses weight. They have to cut the building open to get the person out. That's how they're going to remove me from the White House. And I can't stand this guy, Anthony Atamanik, who used to do this show called The President Show, and he was a total ass, and they canceled it after two seasons, and now he does a podcast from his office in his house called Coffee with Tony. And you're all invited to come on. Goodbye. Why would we want, why would we want to come on with a loser in his basement? Goodbye, <laughs> Mr. President. What? Donnie from Queens, ladies and gentlemen. Donnie from Queens. Oh my gosh. Oh, that was hysterical. And yes, that was that was Anthony Antimic, who is a great impressionist of Donald Trump. Rick Wilson, that was a surprise for you, my friend. So you have and a chance I to finally talk surprised. to Donald Trump. <laughs> oh my goodness. We have a lot of fun here at the Lincoln Project. And I think that's something that it, that makes us so unconventional because I say it all the time, laughter is good like medicine and you have to have some levity in the middle of all of this freaking chaos or else sure. you know, you'll know you never stay sane. So uh, again, a big thank you to Anthony for calling in and giving us some good laughs. And uh, Rick, I know that you have to go. So I wanted to make sure that you had an opportunity to be a part of all of that. If you have any final words before you go and I will carry on the show, Tiki wants to hear it also. Tiki wants to hear it. Uh, yeah. just once again, folks, I just want to express for my for myself uh, and for the creative team and for everybody at the Lincoln Project, uh, you know, the, our enormous and profound gratitude to everything you've done to help us move the ball forward. Uh, I want to wish everyone a very Merry Christmas or a Happy Hanukkah. Um, and we will be back in this fight and we will be continuing to move forward. So thank you very much, everybody. And Stuart, Reed, I, I see Fred Wellman's yeah, coming right. up. You guys are going to replace... Me with Fred, which is a real win for you guys, honestly. I mean, hell. He's, yeah. he's, oh, he's, you're irreplaceable. He's, he's aces, my friends. And good night, <laughs> Kiki. Good night, Tara. We'll see you guys later. Thanks, good night, Rick. And have, have a Merry Christmas, my friend. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, Love it. <laughs> welcome to Fred Wellman, uh, one of our key senior advisors at the Lincoln Project. And Tiki's butt can get out of this. 
Thank you, Tiki. Uh, one of the senior advisors here at the Working Project, uh, all things veterans. Um, he's a veteran himself, and we appreciate you, Fred. Welcome to this wonderful celebration we're having tonight. Great to be back, and uh, I'm replacing Tiki's butt, so thank you for that. <laughs> yes, you, you know, some people might think that that's cuter, but you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's the internet, it's the internet. Um, so, Fred, we're gonna bring you into this conversation and you know, um, I think we should take a, a second and look back at some of the, the media buzz that the Lincoln Project uh, generated over the last year and then we'll talk about it on the other side of that. A new group called the Lincoln Project. The Lincoln Project. The Lincoln Project. The Lincoln Project. It's a group of Republicans who believe the president has abandoned the party's founding principles. Efforts will be dedicated to defeating President Trump and Trumpism at the ballot box. The Republican Party has abandoned its role as a governing party. They just sort of punch drunk on power, I think. Whatever the tenets they used to ascribe to, see, those are all gone. It's now whatever Donald Trump wants, whatever Mitch McConnell wants. The only option with any real integrity is to stand up and to speak. That's what the elected Republicans are supposed to be doing. I just couldn't be a member of a party that had descended into an autocratic cult of personality. You gotta call it like it, like it really is, and they have given themselves over to a cult. Some of the most gut-punching, bare-knuckled, and most widely viewed anti-Trump ads of this election season have not come from the Biden campaign. They've come from the Lincoln Project. Unyielding, unrelenting, ass-kicking of Donald Trump. The ad got more than half a million views, among them the president, who unleashed a tweet storm. We had a psychological profile of Donald Trump, and we did everything we could to antagonize him, to destabilize him. Every time Donald Trump loses his mind because a Lincoln Project ad is up, that takes the whole campaign off track. There's one thing you never get back in a campaign, that's a lost day. Trump lashed out in a rambling, incoherent, insult-laden tirade. This is just one of many late-night tweets from the president. Their so-called Lincoln Project is a disgrace to Honest Abe. The president attacked all of us by name, and we raised $2 million in 48 hours. I guess they don't like me, but let me just tell you, these are losers from day one. They should not call it the Lincoln Project. They should call it the Losers Project. <laughs> I love that one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was just, Johnny. It, 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 may, may, Tara, may I just, may I just yeah. say, you know, the, the night of that tweet storm, I was about to go to bed. I think it was about 1030 here in the mountain time zone. Right. Yeah, it was and 1230. I'm, here I'm just doing one, one last, you know, scr scroll of Twitter. And I, and I look, what is, what, what has he done here? And then I'm looking like, we got him. We got him. <laughs> <laughs> and then I look down and I laugh even harder. And my wife laughs at me because he spelled my last name wrong. He called me right. Reed Galvin, which I That's feel right. really bad because there's some poor guy named Reed Galvin somewhere in this country who got hate mail for probably a month. Um, He's probably that. still getting it. Um, but, you know, so that then was probably, he, you know, then so Reed, he, that was that was probably one of your yes moments. Like I asked Jennifer, um, sure. what were some of her yes moments that because explain to people how much money we raised as a result of that. Yeah, I mean, well, just so you know, you know, it's Rick gave you the backstory on the on the Morning in America ad, which is where what he saw. Um, but that was, a, I think, that was an ad that we spent maybe fifteen thousand dollars producing. And the spot where he saw it, I think, it was either on Tucker or Hannity. The one particular spot was like forty eight hundred dollars. Um, and two, you know, in the next two days, we raised two million dollars on our way to raising nearly eighty for the cycle, um, which. You know, I, I guess in, in the height of irony, without Donald Trump, we wouldn't be here in so many ways that you could take that. But it was it was really the beginning of um, what would be, I think, our you know meteoric rise. And, you know, thanks, as, as Rick said, on his way out to everybody who made that possible. Um, but, you know, without Donald Trump seeing that, without him losing his mind and then standing in front of Air Force One and calling us losers on national television. I mean, you just couldn't believe it. It was the best marketing we possibly ever could have gotten. And, uh, you know, it helped, certainly helped us achieve our first goal. But our second one, as we've talked about, is still still out there. That's right. And I, I don't think anyone expected him to take the bait so beautifully. Um, or so often. That would, right. So often. That yeah, he can't resist. Right. That was the beginning of him uh, 
going after what Lincoln Project was doing more than once. And we knew we had them at that point. And it just, you know, it, it was a springboard to more of the creative genius of poking fun at Donald Trump and him continuing to respond to it. Uh, Fred, you worked really closely on the veterans issues. You were kind of our eyes and ears and pulse of that community, which, which played a, a huge role in this, uh, given that it came out that Donald Trump had said these disparaging things about our men and women in uniform um, yeah. and his use of the military as political props over and over again and the despicable use yeah. of, of the Joint Chiefs during that June 1st um, uh, clearing out of Lafayette Square for that ridiculous Bible, stupid oh, <laughs> photo op. It was infuriating. Yeah. Um, so as you look back, what were some of the, the, the moments for you that really stand out during during this election cycle and your work with? Yeah, you know, I was on a plane when what we call the losers and suckers stories as commonly known now came out. I, I remember I was actually I was texting you, Reed, I remember. And, I, and, I, and you just know, you know, it's like this is this is big. And the way my phone blew up from, you know, fellow veterans and military service members and family members, like the outrage. And I knew that we had, you know, we had a thematic we could, that, would, that would make it clear finally. And, and we had been saying from the day I joined their team that, you know, Donald Trump does not actually love the troops, that Donald Trump doesn't actually support the troops, that he's made a habit of, you know, taking money from them to build his ridiculous wall to, you know, schools are falling down and there's mold in housing. And so it really truly gave us a great vehicle for that. So that was a big aha moment for me. But, but you know, it, you got to laugh the things that matter is, um, I, I think it was a four days for the election read. Um, I got this bright idea that, you know, uh, you know, Trump was saying he didn't want to count votes after, you know, November 3rd. And of course we know that military ballots consistently, military absentee ballots do come in late, especially with the postal service issues. So I got the idea, I said, hey, look, I'd love to recruit a celebrity and do a quick ad saying, hey, look, let's make sure we count military votes. And, and you gotta love, what I love about being a part of the Lincoln Project is I throw these ideas at you guys and I throw these, you know, or Rick or Reed say, hey, I've got this crazy idea. And, and, and Rick's user response is, I love it. Let's do it. And then and Reed was like, I said, Reed, can I do this? He's like, yeah, you got carte blanche, do whatever you sure. want. They probably think I wouldn't pull it off. And, and so I start dialing for the celebrities and I'm a huge Star Wars geek. And uh, after failing on multiple fronts, you know, Tom Hanks is in Australia or something, you know, yeah, uh, you know my son's like, hey, you know, you should, you should DM Mark Hamill. You know? <laughs> so, so I DM'd Mark Hamill and, and within 24 hours, we had Mark Hamill reading words that we wrote, you know, overnight uh, in an ad uh, urging sure. every military ballot be counted. Uh, um, sure. and, and it ended up being very powerful for me. But, you know, just, you know, being a kid who grew up, you know, and saw Star Wars in the theaters, you know, nine times as, you know, eight year old, you know, 10 year old. <laughs> To, uh, to, yeah. So it's just, but you realize, and it sounds funny, but it, it, it goes to the movement um, that these kind of people, that the, the the icons of our nation followed this movement and joined us in this movement. And, and it was like a no brainer. I mean, I, I remember we were actually... Um, we had had a moment to take a break. We went out to the local distillery, if you remember, in, in Park City there. And, and, and Mark called me on my cell phone while I'm checking out. Um, and it, it's just, it, you know, he's a fan. And so when you have those moments, you realize that, and I, I think Reed, you said something really beautiful in one of our last calls for the election. And what you talked about is, you know, we started off the dream of making a difference, of, of, of you know, fighting Trump, uh, and then found ourselves in the middle of a cultural movement, a, a moment in American history, you know, 2.5 million followers, if you will, on Twitter or anything else. And, and I think, I don't think anyone involved in this effort um, was never, we were always aware, I think for me at least, I was always aware of where I sat in the middle of a moment. Um, you know, I'm an old soldier. I, I, I had the chance to go to war. I, I invaded Iraq twice. I, I liked it so much, I kept going back. And, you know, I did Desert Storm. I was one of the first wave in, the de in Iraq and Desert Storm. I was in the first wave into Iraq and OIF. Um, and, and as a young soldier, you're, you know, you're flying in a helicopter, you go, yeah, this is, this is gonna go down in the history books. I'm, I'm in the middle of history. And I had that same feeling as we sat there um, as we closed on the election day, as we, as we made these moves and, and even today. So, you know, for me, I'm, I'm just thrilled to be a part of this, it, it, just a small part of it. But it, it, I think that's what made this so powerful though, is we have a team that has these ideas and we bounce them against each other and then we just go. There's not a lot of overthinking, um, we pursue it. And, uh, and that's, I think one of the real, that's the, one of the secret sauces of this mission. And, and that's something that made us the envy of our democratic friends on the other side, because yeah. they, didn't have that same level of 
freedom to be able to kind of just go and just do it because they always had a master right. to answer to, um, you know, and have to go through 25 levels of bureaucracy and focus grouping. And this one has to sign off on that one. And which constituency is that going to piss off and which donor, blah, blah, blah. you know, we didn't have to go through all of that because, you know, Lincoln Project really had no boss. Uh, I don't know if it was Rick or <laughs> Reed who said that, or maybe it was Stu. <laughs> Somebody said that where it was like, if you want to do it, if everybody agrees, go ahead and do it. We really don't care who, right. who this is off if, it's, if we think it's the right thing to do. Um, and having that, and so many of my, my friends on the other side were grateful to our rapid responsibility to do that um, and kind of pick up the slack where the Democrats just couldn't, you know, they just, they were trying to stay above the fray and, you know, like Reed said, have a policy, there's going to be a policy uh, campaign. <laughs> we we're like, yeah, okay, good luck with that. Um, that's not going to work. So here, don't, don't worry. Let, let us handle and, it. And that culture. Not- and Tara, that culture, you know, I, I had the good fortune to, you know, uh, be a part of the pod in Park City and and spend a lot of quality time with our, a lot of our junior staff. And it was remarkable, you know, watching the debates and the vice president debate and the, and the other debates. And we're sitting there with young Kate Salkowitz, which is a name a lot of people may not know, or Phil uh, Phil um, Germain, who is our gear guy. And, and these two young people, 23, I think, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and something happens real time on the debate. And Kate is is literally on her giant Mac that she carried everywhere, cranking out a video in about a minute and a half as as other staff members are giving ideas. Phil was actually turning merchandise before the debate was over. I, I think they I think uh, the Just Shut Up Man t-shirt was online and shipping before the debate was over. Um, and I think right. that's what's so remarkable about this, the leadership team. And I don't want to, since I'm a senior advisor, I can gloat on you guys a little bit more. <laughs> you know, it is is that the the the, the gift you gave. Um, a lot of young people, which we don't hear a lot about with our, in our, our method of our, our, our story, but these young people that joined this mission and embraced it, but were given such power to have these genius ideas and to pursue them with abandon. Um, and again, I'm, I'm an old codger. I've been in, I was in the army for a long time in business. Um, it, it was just really inspiring for me to sit on a couch and watch these incredibly smart young people do incredibly brilliant things that were moving the nation uh, with their words and with their deeds. So I, I think I think that's one of the, another piece of the secret sauce we're going to talk about enough. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I, I would say this too, Tara, is that and as you and Stuart can both attest that you know political campaigns are, are probably one of the few meritocracies left. Um, that if you're young and you're talented, uh, your reward is more work, <laughs> right? Not, not <laughs> is somebody worried that you're too smart or you're too good at what you do is that you generally get more responsibility and more things to, to have to take care of on a daily basis because there's always more to do. Uh, and the folks right. who are trying to make decisions never have quite enough time to make every decision they want. So finding someone, you know, like, I mean, whether or not it was our political team, our press team, uh, uh, Fred with the veterans crew, um, you know, everybody here at LPTV, our podcast, our digital team, whoever it was, they were, most of them were very young, right? Maybe they'd yeah. been in a campaign or two, certainly never anything like this, although none of us have ever been part of something like this before. Uh, <laughs> oh. And we all just, we all like, you know, it was like, uh, you know, Fred Flintstone's feet underneath the car, right? We just started going and we didn't stop. And, you know, maybe we slowed down a little bit. The pirate ship does need to be in port, I think, for a little while just to, to get refit. But we'll be back out at sea here real quick. And for everybody who's under or everybody who's under 40, uh, you can Google Fred Flintstone and know Reed's reference. Go ahead, Stu. <laughs> <laughs> I want In these last uh, six weeks, what kind of reaction have you gotten from the, the veteran community and the, the military community? Um, because, you know, we always, the, the assumption is that there's, Trump has this huge military support. And uh, I think numerically that, that wasn't proving as as strong as they hoped it to be. But what have you heard uh, from your your community over the last six weeks um, during this sort of attempted coup? Well, you know, the obviously the military veteran community does reflect America. You know, we there are there are certainly hardcore Trumpists mm-hmm. within our ranks. Um, but what's really been inspiring is that that has broken. I think we did see that in the vote that the military vote itself, uh, by all counts, seems to have actually gone against Trump, or at least close enough that it you know certainly certainly right. a gigantic gain by Mr. Biden over what uh, what Hillary Clinton did. Um, but honestly, the reaction has been overwhelmingly in my circles horror and, and almost almost laughter. You know, every time you see. 
General Flynn of all people, you know, oh, we'll have martial law or where you see them saying, oh yeah, they're, they're preparing. Everybody's laughing. Like, no, everybody's preparing to go on freaking Christmas block leave, dude. Nobody's going anywhere. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it, if they are preparing for it, they're prepared to deploy the freaking you know, vaccine. Um, so there's been a lot of disdain and, and, and actual horror. I, I think, I think for many people in my circles, especially in the veteran military community, this last six weeks has been you know, so eye-opening and this, that everyone's willing to go to this much of a length to undermine their votes. And then if you look at what they tried to throw out, um, and we've been playing that pretty hard, is they're specifically trying to throw out military votes. They, they went after an effort. If you, The lawsuits were, the Nevada lawsuit, if you recall, Stuart, um, was, they literally tried to throw out military, valid military ballots. Well, saying, well, these people don't live in Nevada. Yeah, no shit. They don't live in Nevada. They, they're military. They've deployed overseas. They live in Georgia now. Um, and so I, I think you've, their GOP has really hurt themselves. Uh, I, I don't, I don't think they get it. A lot of folks just don't get it that the military is looking at and living it and realizing that it's dangerous. And now let's throw in today's new twist. We're just going to try and veto the NDAA, uh, you know, the defense bill over the Confederate base names and some random shit about China. So, so I really do think um, they're not acquitting themselves well in the military, but by far I've seen um, mostly disdain and then and a little bit of horror over the whole thing. But it's just, you know, the idea that the military would participate in martial law or a coup is, it's so ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. It's just, it's just ridiculous. If this, you know, if this shift continues, I mean, all the years we worked in Republican politics, um, we, you know, for Bush, or uh, I mean, we we pretty much could get a solid military vote. At least you know we right. thought that that was the course. Do you think this is a cultural yeah. shift or, or a political yes. shift, whatever the right word is, that is going to continue? No, I do, and, and we've seen it coming. Um, you know, the post nine eleven generation is they're millennials, they're Gen Zers. Though right. that generation, as it is, is more you know more progressive. They're they're a little bit more uh, worldly, if you will. Uh, and so we saw that. that. That's why, if you remember, we, I think you saw the hint of this, Stu, back when "Don't Ask, Don't Tell" was repealed, and all the old timers that were me, my age, and older were like, "It's the end of the army. We'll never recover." And it was a huge nothing. I mean, I remember remember they did it, and the soldiers like, "Yeah, no, no shit, that guy's gay." We, we knew he was gay. He always shows whatever he found with his, his roommate, <laughs> you know. So, so the Gen Zers and the millennials were like, uh, "Yeah, no kidding." It, it's it's the old timers that look like me with the gray hair that were always having these apocalyptic dreams. So, I think we've already were seeing since post nine eleven generation that there's been a political shift where it's much more of a split. It wasn't mm -hmm. a solid red as it used to be. Now, with this these antics and more, I think you're seeing more of it. You know, the, the, what I said a lot during the campaign was that you know the military people aren't fooled by the lies you know they know the pay raise was not big they know that the school at fort campbell is falling down because donald trump took the military construction budget and shipped it to his wall they know the truth of what's going on and they know that the deployments have not gone down just because he doesn't want to do them anymore they've they got troops deployed to poland they got troops deployed to korea still so so i think you really see but i do believe we've seen a political shift i think you're going to see a lot more of a more progressive stance at least a more even split in the military ranks than you've seen in the past mm -hmm. and and like we said Stu. It, it should have been a walk off home run for an incumbent Republican president to take the military vote and the veteran vote without even trying that hard. But Donald Trump has done such a spectacularly incompetent job as commander in chief. He didn't he didn't get it. And so, no, so I, I do think fraud. we're seeing the movement. I do. It, was, it was because it was fraud, Fred. It was it was fraud. Right, there right. couldn't have possibly oh, been, yeah. you know, military votes that went for Joe Biden, according to the affidavits uh, in the I, Donald Trump uh Lawsuits, right. for God's sakes. Um, Tara, just, you talked just, about it. You know, go ahead, Reed. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, no, go ahead, Tara. One quick second. Uh, Trump, just speaking of institutions that Trump has attacked and doesn't have any respect for, he just tweeted, I am very disappointed in the United States Supreme Court, and so is our great country. So apparently now the Supreme Court is part of the deep state, and... Um, you know, everyone, everyone's against him. And now he's going to turn his crazies against the Supreme Court. I, I, it's there is there really is. There it is. There really is no bottom with this guy. And let's see how many let's see how many Republicans come out and condemn condemn him attacking the Supreme Court. I, I wouldn't hold Zero. my breath. Um, so, go ahead. Reason so, that we have a well, to get. To. Oh, yeah. So so just a couple of quick things. One is that the, the Supreme Court is literally the deep state. There are nine people there that are there for life. Right. So yeah. like no, we're not really. deeper than that. Dug in. Um, but second, Fred, I'd love to ask a question. You mentioned you mentioned Flynn. Mm -hmm. What what does it take for someone who wore three stars on their shoulders to, to, to have this kind of transformation? Was it that he was always a little off? Was it that he was, you know, he was aggrieved after Obama? I don't know, was either relieved him or wasn't going to promote him. 
Um, right. You know, is it, was it, you know, I mean, clearly after he left the service, you know, he had, he had gone to this thing in Russia. He was in cahoots with the Turks, like, but going from someone who had risen almost as high as you can in the United States military to a place where he's now, you know, in front of a fire pit, giving the, you know, the QAnon pledge, like, how does that happen to someone like him? It's, it's scary, isn't it? And, and actually, I was in a robust conversation on Twitter before we went on, um, where a number of my fellow officers, especially, are saying, because I, I think I saw Flynn was on OAN today talk about martial law or newsbacks, oh, one of them. God. And, and, and yeah, and, and, and there's a robust conversation saying, you know, Mike Jason, who's a retired army colonel, one of our veteran leadership council members is, you know, the army needs, to, the army needs to answer for this. The army's promotion system needs to be examined that an officer like this was promoted and promoted and promoted. And we could, we could spend hours. I, 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 one thing I say a lot online about Flynn is I've never yet met a soldier who worked for him who says, oh man, I love working for him. It just, it just, the signs were always there. He always treated his, his subordinates very poorly. He always stepped on people when he became you know, direct, you know, his job there, the, with the DIA, you know, he, 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 it's a lot of people forgotten. He was very Islamophobic. Um, they couldn't get him off of Islamophobic issues and everything was about his, you know, Islam. Um, he told women how to dress more modestly. He's always been a little bit off and he got promoted through uh, the auspices of senior officers who, you know, took care of him. Um, they, he got promoted because the general officer, you know, culture is one of uh, not to criticize their peers when they deserve to be. Uh, and, and he was really bitter when he got, he, he got promoted as far as he got. And then when Obama decided not to renew his, his two-year term at DIA, he just lost his, just went off the right deep end. But, but yeah, I, I do think, I hope that the army will take a reckoning and say, uh, we have a system that produced someone like this. And there's others, by the way, since 9-11, which we could talk about for an hour, but I won't. But you know, yeah, it, it is shocking, isn't it? It's shocking that someone who at the highest ranks, and it's, it's, it's horrifying to me as a former officer, and I don't try to wear my rank. I think you guys, I think we used my rank on one appearance, I think in Veterans Day. I, you know, look, I, I, reti- I was nobody, I retired as Lieutenant Colonel, but but that was my, you know, I, I, using that in this world as a civilian and using that as a cudgel against civilians, especially to respect me and take my opinion as better than their own because I served is, is something that goes against the ethos of the military. And honestly, General Flynn, his, his Twitter handle is General Flynn. You know, he, he this yeah. is his persona and, uh, and he's using it and he's making money off of it and he's using it for really horrible ways right now. I, I, it, it, is, it, is, it's, it makes my blood run cold when I see the things that he's saying. Well, you know what, so, Fred, that, that's, a, that's actually a good um, transition to bring in another one of our senior advisors, good friends, has been with us on the front lines of the fight. Uh, Michael Steele, come on in, Michael. And but, there uh, is. Well, there he uh, is. <laughs> Happy anniversary, baby. Come on, uh, man. See, he, see, yeah, he brought a I, drink. I, you know, <laughs> you know I, I always go conserve and don't bring a drink. I should have brought a drink. <laughs> oh, no, you think you're, you're – you're free to drink on this show. You say anniversary, <laughs> I'm like, how much? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Michael Steele, uh, my good friend, I adore you. We've been friends for a very long time. And, you know, we've been having this conversation. I know you've been listening uh, about things that are reexamining and kind of our shock about how far the Republican Party has fallen. Fred has been right. talking about changes in the military. And you, my friend, are still holding on to the Republican Party. I'm sure you heard that Jennifer Horn left today. You know I that know. I'm on. Reed, Reed doesn't even want to hear the word Republican Party anymore. Stu wrote a freaking book about that's it with the damn Republican Party. Michael Steele, wh- my friend. Don't ask what me the question you ask me every time. I'm going to keep asking you because the motherfuckers are getting crazier. So go ahead. <laughs> Why are you still there? <laughs> Someone has got to chronicle this bullshit. Someone has got to stand there in the, on the front porch and go, oh, hell no, this is not Republicanism. But before I get into that, I just want to tell you how much I, I, I love uh, Fred Wellman. Listening to him just now, just talk about his service, talk about this effort. Thank you, Fred, for everything, man. It just, it just kind of, it, it's sobering, it's, it's uplifting, and you understand um, and you can hear in your voice, you know, the concern that we should all have about the kind of men and women uh, who uh, serve in the military, especially when uh, they wind up like a Flynn undermining that that service. So I, I just appreciated that. And then, of course, my, my buddy Stu and the whole gang. It's just it's real great to see everybody and, and to celebrate 
with you. And and Reed is just, uh, he, you know, he's like, you know, that that thing in your head that goes, no, 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 we're going to do this. And you're like, oh, can we get away with that? <laughs> <laughs> Have I ever told anybody they couldn't do something? I mean, literally, okay, 365. No, days. I don't. I don't, I don't think, think you ever did. I never ever heard you. Something. No. But so the answer to the question is: Look, you know, I don't know how long I'm standing on this front porch. To tell you the truth, after all, <laughs> all this shit that's gone down this week, and it's only Thursday. Um, no, I, you know, but I, I do believe fundamentally in. The value system, uh, and and until I can figure out the tweak, uh, along with a lot of other really really smart people, a hell of a lot smarter than me, fill out fill, you know figure out the tweak on how you can actually stand up something that that tosses that shit out and and reestablishes something fresh and different. Um, you know, I'm just, I'm a placeholder. <laughs> I'm just a placeholder. You know, I, I'm here as a reminder. Uh, it's like that. It's like uh, when King Arthur um, sings about Camelot in Camelot. Uh, you know, he talks about there once was a spot where, you know, great things happened and uh, we can't forget about that. And, and that's, that's kind of what, that's what I do. You know, I'm just kind of there. Making noise. I know. Listen, I hear you, Michael, on this, but it's Drinking when you have. I know. Well, aren't we all? You know, aren't we all? My husband and I are members of about four different wine clubs here in Virginia, Virginia, because that's how we made it through this whole thing. That's really the secret to all of it. We oh, drank our way through the entire election. Um, but I, you know, Mike, I know how hard this is. You know, and and it's. I just find that. Even on policy, right, the Republicans have just gone in a direction that we never expected. But when it comes down to the fundamentals, like what we've seen over the last couple of weeks of like literally becoming an anti-democracy party that's trying to take down, the, I mean, martial law, martial law coming out of the right. mouths of these people, you know, um, you know, destroy the Republican Party chants from these wackadoos, mm -hmm. you know, I, I mean... Donald Trump now going after the Supreme Court, like this is what is what's making it so much harder. And that's why I, I, I'm always going to give you shit about this because I don't, all of us have decided that this, at this point, there's, there's no way for us to get past this because the party's irredeemable institutionally now when they're sitting back and letting this happen. What do you see for the future of the party? Uh, no, it's not bright. Uh, I think Stuart put his finger on a little bit earlier in the conversation. No, it's not bright. Uh, it, it is it is a, a lost opportunity. You know, they could have, you know, all kinds of, you know, makeovers and remakes and, you know, redos. And, autopsies. And <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, well, I realize now that that document was actually very appropriately named because it, you know, it was about dead things. And, um, and that's, that's pretty much what what's happened here. So that's what that is, and and there are a lot of people that are caught up into that into that space. But what I what I what I love and, and loved and still love about my association with you guys and with Lincoln Project is that you 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 offer a light that says, "Hey, there is another way," you know. You don't. You don't have to. You know, like the T-shirt said, "I'm with stupid." No, you don't have to be with stupid, baby. You don't. You really don't. And so, the more we're able to create that pathway for people to find the other way, another way, I think. I think that's going to be exciting. That's you know. You know, I'm. I find myself walking further and further away from the party. You know, maybe, maybe I get to where a lot of my friends. <laughs> <laughs> on this in this conversation are um, but whether it's now tomorrow or some time from now it's it's how we continue to bring other Americans with us and how we right. continue to animate the idea of democracy um, okay. look we know we know that's not going to get done in a one party system and, and certainly if that one party is the Democrats well, <laughs> good luck and so we know that right. all right um, and, and we know what is left, the remnant, uh, which it shouldn't be Republican, it should be remnant. Um, you know, the remnant party, whatever left of that, it's just going to continue to wither. 
So I think we've got a great opportunity here to have a different conversation uh, and to sort of accelerate, if you will, uh, this idea of America yet being plural, pluralistic in its, in its society and its culture and all that, but also in its politics. And I, and I, and I kind of like that part of it. Michael, yep. let me ask you, I got a question for you. Why do you, you, you really look, you got two different Republican parties in a way. We've got this federal party, which we talk about, this national party. But then you have where you live. You have, you have a Governor Hogan, you have a Governor Scott, a Governor Baker. Why is it that they're, they're almost like in a different world of republicanism and the party is so distinct from that? Why is it not being embraced? I mean, they're, they're selling the product in the hardest markets in the world. And How that's is this why, happening? And that's why. They're selling the product in the hardest market in the world. They actually have to work at it. They actually have to uh, listen, pay attention, respond, right? If, 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 if I'm in a bubble and the only thing I hear is myself and everyone echoing what I say, you know, there, there's no growth there. There's, no, there's, there's nothing pressing up against uh, the idea uh, that I just said something incredibly asinine. And someone, someone go, oh, hold up, no, no, we ain't doing that stupid. We're not doing that. Um, but when you are in a Hogan uh, or, or a Baker uh, situation where they are Republican governors in blue states, it's a different conversation. You have to account for everybody. You just can't ram it down the throat. You just can't say this is how it is. And you can't go out and tout the stuff that you hear from the national leadership. Look, it's something I learned a long time ago growing up in DC and when I got involved in politics in Prince George's County, Maryland. You know, as a county chairman of, of uh, in a county of 800,000 people, Stu, where there are only 58,000 Republicans, how, how, do you win, how do you win anything? You have to find the common ground, man. You gotta find that space where all those Democrats are looking at me like, Mm-hmm. What you gonna do, right? I've got to get past that and into here, and into here uh, by opening up the conversation as best I can. And this starts with listening. What I think fundamentally has happened is the party has stopped listening because mm -hmm. they 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 feel right. that they don't they don't need to account to anyone or anybody or anything about what they're saying. So they just stop listening. You know, that's um, that's actually a good transition for me to uh, to read, because I know we're about to say goodnight to read and we appreciate you for your time tonight. Um, with that said, right, we're having this conversation about the future of the Republican Party and kind of what do we do here? And Tiki's very interested in it, but he's going to go over here. Um, what's the future of the Lincoln, the Lincoln Project? A lot of folks have asked. They want to know. They're like, are we what are we doing now that that, you know, Trump is defeated, but Trumpism is not. You know, uh, as your departing words, uh, explain to our supporters what is the future of the Lincoln Project and what can they expect from us come uh, the new year? Yeah, well, first, you know, let me let me say before I get to any of that, thanks to to you, Tara, and to Chairman Steele and to Fred and to Stuart for all your help uh, this year. You know, we could not have done it without you. And I think that, you know, we are, you know, as broad a based an organization as we have been in the last 365 days. Um, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, I think that to the chairman's point that, you know, we are able to uh, bring people along because we do listen. Because, Tara, I think the things that you and Rick do twice a week and what Jennifer does twice a week, uh, you know, what we do when we have our town hall meetings is we listen, we answer questions, and we're honest with people. Uh, I think that's almost shocking probably to a lot of people that uh, that are looking for political information or political someplace to just, you know, it, maybe we're not a party. We're more like a political Airbnb, right? You may not live here forever, but it's a safe place for now. Um, and so, um, you know, what comes next? I think, you know, look, as I noted earlier, I think there's a really good chance Donald Trump's mm -hmm. going to announce his, you know, next campaign, which is going to mean he's not going anywhere. Uh, and as I said, it means it's going to hold a lot of Republicans in place in these very Trumpy, you know, authoritarian, fascistic positions uh, that we're going to have to push back on. Uh, I think that, you know, as we were part of a large and broad coalition to help Joe Biden get elected, I think that we will remain part of that coalition that helps him try to govern as, you know, he and Senator Harris or President, excuse me, Vice President-elect Harris 
uh, take office and try and really start to tackle COVID, uh, you know, as the president and vice president. Um, and that will mean, you know, sometimes protecting his right flank, sometimes protecting his left flank. Uh, I think that means, you know, holding a lot of these Republicans to account, whether or not it's the 126 members of the House who, you know, signed onto a seditious document uh, or letting the 90 Republicans left know that, you know, that's not OK. Uh, making sure that Mitch McConnell and a lot of Republican senators understand that obstruction for its own sake is not going to be all right. And then obviously, um, you know, there's some folks we're going to take a look at in 2022. Um, both in the Senate and I think at the states. Uh, and then last, I think, and this will be something that you'll see on LPTV coming soon, is that, you know, I think we're really going to be, you know, a, uh, you know, the tip of the spear on a lot of this misinformation, disinformation, uh, you know, fighting, you know, as we see Facebook. Now we're really hearing about YouTube, which I heard about the first time tonight, which I didn't realize this. There was a Pew poll, I think, that said that a quarter of Americans get their news from YouTube and it has almost no filters uh, does almost no tracking of the algorithms that drive people to the worst content. Um, and I think that folks need, you know, some more honest, you know, talk and, and, and information politically that they can get and feel like that, you know, the only thing we're in it for is democracy. Uh, I think that we want to partner with people on, you know, a new Voting Rights Act, a new Civil Rights Act, that we need to really focus on election security, whether or not that means keeping, you know, foreign actors uh, out of our system or improving the system for, you know, elections officials at the state and local levels. There's a lot of work to be done at the foundational pieces of these of, of democracy long before we ever get to policy. And so, you know, I think there's a lot of work for us to be done. We'll have more to say about that <clears throat> right after Christmas. And then of course, we've still got to get through the Georgia runoffs. And so that's January 5th. And so, you know, look to see, you know, a lot more from us on what's to come right after the new year. But I just want to say thank you to, as I said, everyone who was on the Lincoln Project team, we had nearly 40 staff, 50 interns, tens of thousands of volunteers, hundreds of thousands of individual contributors and millions of followers. And I can only say thank you that we are beyond humbled for everything you've done for us. I'll tell you, Tara, one of the greatest things, and I think we were talking about this earlier today uh, on Jennifer's show is that when I was talking to someone earlier today and, and she said, well, what are we gonna do next? I'd never mm -hmm. spoken to her on the phone before. Uh, but to me, that was as great a thing as I could hear because that meant that she had ownership in this too. And I think yep. that the more folks, as the chairman said, have ownership in this, that feel like that they have a part to play, uh, the better and stronger and more will grow as we get into this next year. So thank you for all you've done, Tara. And thank you for your work, chairman and, and Stu and, and Fred. And thanks to everybody out there. Thank you so much, Reed. And I think I can say that it has been a pleasure for and, and, a, and an honor for most of us to be a part of this movement and uh, to be a part of what you guys started. And uh, there's, there's still work to be done, and uh, we look forward to it. So, Reed Galen, thank you so much. Uh, Thanks, Say goodnight to the family. Have a Merry Christmas, and uh, we'll see you after the holiday. All right. Thanks, all. All right. With that, we want to take a couple of your tweets because people have been asking us lots of questions, and we want to thank all of you for sending in your questions, for being so engaged with us on social media. Believe me, we read a lot of your tweets. And on Facebook, the same thing. We thank you to all of our Facebook viewers. Keep commenting. Believe me, we read a lot of your comments. They do not go into internet space. We do see a lot of what you say. and We want you to continue to comment and continue to tweet at us and like and subscribe and do all those things um, and stay engaged because the Lincoln Project isn't going anywhere. So let's throw up a tweet. All right. What do you think about many Dems' skepticism of your motives on the basis of your past work as Republican political operatives? Um, I'll answer that really quickly. Uh, I think that people need to realize that they, if the people who are still questioning that um, are clearly not paying attention to who the Lincoln Project is. Uh, most of us, except for Michael Steele, most of us have <laughs> denounced the Republican Party and said that, Stop. you know, we are done with that. You know, I'm, I'm gonna forever give you shit about this, Michael, until you finally make a leap. <laughs> but most of, us, <laughs> most of us have said that we, we have called out the Republican Party and for the duplicitousness, for the hypocrisy. And some of us have, have given mea culpas and written books like Stu Stevens about our roles in things that have led to this era of Trumpism. So to question our motives at this point, tells me that they're not being intellectually honest or paying attention to who and what the Lincoln Project actually is. So um, that's what I say to those folks. Uh, the proof is in the pudding and what we do. And clearly, 
um, they, there should be no reason to be skeptical that any of us are going back to what led to the moment we're in now. I think we've all been sufficiently woke at this point. What's the next tweet? <clears throat> what are the major holes in our election process that need to be plugged to avoid protracted drama like we are experiencing and how do we fix it? That's from Zelda Shagnesty. Um, Michael Steele, I'm actually gonna throw that to you because you, as a former national chairman, you know, you are pretty well versed in how our election system works and you saw some of the, the good, the bad, and the bad and the ugly about our system even when you were chairman and compare that to now. So I'll let you go ahead and answer that. Yeah, the, you'd be surprised. Um, despite the, the, the efforts of Donald Trump and the Republican Party, the, despite the efforts of Republican governors who, uh, and legislators who, who try to uh, you know, reconfigure the, the vote uh, in this cycle, the one thing about our system, it is, it is hard to cheat. <laughs> It is hard as hell to cheat. Now, what happens is, you know, things get blown up. So you get to see or you hear a story about something that happened over there. But what you lose sight of that, let's say, for example, if you're looking at a period between um, uh, 2016 and, and 2018, and you look at the presidential cycle, so and we know the drama that was there, plus the, um, the cycles in between, the off-year cycles and the 2018 cycle, um, there were very, very few of all those votes cast. There were very, very few um, instances of voter fraud um, or fraudulent activity that um, you know, prosecutors actually brought charges. So that's, that's the good thing. We cannot overstate enough that our system is actually very, Pretty, pretty much secure. It was very, very secure, particularly given the way paper ballots are utilized and now technology is being utilized to reinforce those paper ballots. That doesn't mean there aren't holes. Uh, and there are some things that we will have to take a look at um, that open up the voting process, not actually shutting it down, because that's the reaction a lot of people want to go to. Well, you know, this whole thing with mail-in ballots. Well, folks, if we don't do mail-in ballots, then military men and women will not be able to vote because <laughs> that's the only way they can vote. Expatriates yeah. who are living overseas um, but still are U.S. residents, but their job has them stationed in London, what are they going to do, right? So the process is what we need to take a look at to make sure that it aligns with the other security measures that we have that will make sure that everybody's vote is counted. Um, and again, I think part of that process needs to be look at moving the election from the dead of winter, like the month of November. You know, it's not the dead of winter, but it's pretty damn cold in parts of the country. Um, and it's dark at four o'clock in the afternoon and polls are open till eight. Um, so there, there are a lot of things that we can look at that I think will make it a little bit more accessible and reinstate that trust uh, that was taken away uh, from voters by Donald Trump and his antics. Indeed, perhaps either make uh, election day a national holiday, or maybe move it from a Tuesday. I think there's lots of structural structural things that we could do to make it easier. Because in a democracy, it should be easier to vote in a free and fair election, not more difficult, um, right. as what the Republicans have been trying to do for years now. Unfortunately, uh, all right, we have one last tweet. What was the most surprising thing you've all learned over the last year? Uh, I'll make this a quick round robin. Um, I'll start with you, Stu Stevens, and then we'll go to Fred, then to Mike, and I'll end it. Stu, what was the most surprising thing you've seen in the last year? I never would have imagined that Republicans would not admit who won the presidential race. <laughs> I mean, it's like you walk out of the Super Bowl and you're having a debate about who won. It's the craziest thing imaginable, and it is so toxic. So, I, you know, as, as pessimistic as I was about the Republican Party, this is just absolutely uh, just floored me. Mm -hmm. Fred? You know, I'm actually, of, the, of all of us, I'm the guy who's the new the politics guy, right? I was just, I was a veteran and I was an advocacy guy before I came here. Um, for me, I think what for me was surprised, aside from the, the behavior of, our, of the Republican Party, um, 
it was fascinating to me to see from the inside of a campaign that how important it is that we stay focused on the objective. You know, when, when, when RBG passed away, um, we took a lot of flack from folks saying, okay, are you guys going to weigh in on the ACB nomination? Are you going to do your thing? And, and our team was very clear. It was like, we're, that's not our mission. Our mission is to, it, it, none of this matters if we lose the election. And if we spend our, our, our the money that our hard, our wonderful donors have given us to pursue in the end, what would be a you know a flawed campaign that was going to lose because the law was on their side? Um, we we had to stick to the ball, and, and the ball was always win elections, make policy, right? And so I think it's always been a Republican talking. You know, we, we always said that if it doesn't do you any good to to have great policy if you don't win the election. So I think for me, it was surprised to see you know, we we kind of took some pretty good hits from folks saying, "Well, are you why are you guys not fighting this?" It's like because none of this matters if Trump gets reelected. Because if you think it's bad with the six you know six three, wait till it's seven three uh our seven two so so i think for me it was surprising that, that, that to see that from the inside especially on the, on our democratic colleague side is that you know sometimes i think they we, we lose sight of pursuing um maybe the wrong goals <laughs> you know yeah. and, and to see and we, we, had, we had that chance you know what i'm saying i'm trying to be delicate right. you know yeah. ch chasing chasing windmills right and and i think i think sometimes the democratic party you know does they, they chase windmills they chase policies that that and they forget that it, none of that matters if the Senate is under Big Tunnel's control. It doesn't matter. If Trump's sitting in the White House the next four years, all these great That's ideas right. we have are out the window. And so I, I was really impressed the by the, our leadership and, and, and the fortuitous that it took to take the heat. And that's one thing I love about us. We're, we take the shots to the face and you go, yeah, okay, that's cool. <laughs> you know, but here's what we're going to do. Got, and, got, and, and that was really a cathartic here. moment. Right, you get thick skin. It's like, and and I think we were yeah. right. We we were never going to beat that nomination. It is they had the votes, they had the law right. on their side. What was what was worse Dry is, my prize. God, we lose this election, we're screwed. So for That's me, I right. think it was it was it was really surprising for me. Michael Steele. So it, mine was a combination. Um, that was um, at you know at one point just wonderful, but at the same time unnerving, um, therefore surprising. Uh, the first is that despite the, the, the difficulty and the pain of COVID-19, how it has ravaged the country, how our, our federal leadership was so utterly incompetent um, at dealing with it and so uh, lackadaisical in their concern uh, that the American people remain resilient. And they found it within themselves to participate in unprecedented, by unprecedented numbers uh, in the electoral process. They came out, they voted. Um, almost 100 million, over 100 million people having voted before the actual election day, you know, just want, wanting to participate in the franchise and, and particularly seeing a lot of young people uh do that as well was uh at once surprising and and very uh you know heartening for me to see um that level of engagement uh and, and commitment the other part though that was an equally um surprising was the number of people who wanted four more years of this who wanted four more years of trumpism and um, children in cages and and coddling and cuddling up to dictators and uh, assholes um, and and embracing outwardly uh, and fervently uh, white nationalism as a form of populism um, and and it it says to me that um, regardless of the, pol the politics and the political parties. As Americans, we have a lot more work to do. Um, uh, and so that surprised me just how, how easily people sort of put their arms around the Proud Boys and put their arms around, um, you know, these folks who were protesting civil rights uh, and, and, and wanted to move forward with that. Yeah, and uh, that you 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 stole mine um, at the end there, Michael. I should have only given you one. Um, <laughs> the second one was what I was going to say, which was that um, the the most surprising thing to me 
was that after 300,000 Americans ha have perished and millions infected with a disease that was preventable um, in those large numbers, that 74 million people decided that they wanted four more years of Trumpism. Um, mm -hmm. That was the most shocking part of all of this for me. Uh, I mean, there were a lot of things that surprised me, a lot of people that surprised me, the level of vitriol, the level of cultic um, fealty and obsequiousness to Donald Trump, even after he demonstrated that he didn't give a damn about anyone but himself and allowed millions of people to get sick. Um, that the idea that when they had a chance to say enough is enough, 74 million people went along with that. Um, and that tells me that, but, but the, the upside to that is that 81 million people said no. And right. that gives me hope that there are Americans here who are willing to speak up. And the amount of people who decided to get involved in this movement who were never involved before, the, the amount of people who would write into us or who would tweet at us and say, Thank you for you know getting me involved, for motivating me. I've never gotten involved in politics or ever donated to a political uh, committee before, or anything like that, or put a lawn sign out. I've never done that. I've never been a poll worker. Um, the, the, the amount of people that our movement helped to inspire that said that I don't want my kids to grow up in an environment like this that Donald Trump has fostered and that the Republican Party, unfortunately, has enabled, we're going to do something about it. That was mostly the, that was the highlight of this and what makes us uh, continue to fight and do what we do to save this great democracy. So surprise at where some of our American folks want to go and their embrace of this authoritarian, fascist, racist, nationalist, conspiracy theory, wing nut stuff. Uh, very concerned about that, but encouraged by how many more people are willing to stand up to fight for this republic so we could keep it. On that note, thank you to everyone who joined us on our anniversary show. Thank you to Stu. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Michael Steele. Thank you, Reed, Rick Wilson, and Jennifer Horn, and everyone that's been involved with the Lincoln Project. Thank you guys so much for all of your hard work. Um, you guys have a Merry Christmas, and we'll see you on the other side of it. Keep up the good fight. We'll keep fighting for freedom and having fun. I appreciate you guys. Thanks, Joe. Enjoy it. Thanks, Joe. Good night, guys. And on that note, we wrap up our one year anniversary, the first anniversary of the Lincoln Project. Thank you guys for hanging out with us. Um, we will be back after Christmas on the 29th, the Tuesday after Christmas. So make sure that you come back and join us and stay engaged, sign up, sign up for our newsletter, keep tweeting at us, we'll, we'll, we'll keep it up. We may take a couple of days off for the, for the Christmas break, but um, we're still here, and we really, really do appreciate all of you who have supported the Lincoln Project and continue to do that. Stay tuned. You will get to see a little bit, a sneak peek into what Christmas is like here at my house. If you follow me on social media, you know that we take Christmas here very seriously and have fun doing it. And uh, we, we ha usually have an epic Christmas party every year, but unfortunately, because of COVID, we cannot. So we can we will share our Christmas cheer virtually with all of you. So stay tuned for that. We have a sneak peek into what Christmas looks like in my house a little as soon as the program ends. And if you want to see more detail about how we do it and how we what we do during the holidays, follow me on social media because I put it all there, particularly on Instagram. And like I said, we will see you guys back here December 29th. I want to wish everyone happy holidays, Merry Christmas, and um, Stay safe and hug your loved ones who are with you. Send those hugs virtually if you have to. Wear a mask and stay safe. And we appreciate you and Merry Christmas to everyone. And we'll leave you with our latest Lincoln Project ad right now. We always asked ourselves, it couldn't happen here. Could it? It can. And it will. We're now only one presidential election from the end of America as we've known it. For the first time in our history, a majority of a major political party refused to accept the results of a presidential election. Violent thugs roam the Capitol streets. Crowd boys, stand back and stand by. Tens of millions will now teach their children 
they live in a country with an illegitimate president. This is how democracy dies. Today, the dividing line in American politics is not between conservative and liberal. It's between those who believe in democracy and those who are killing it. By their actions, by their silence. Trumpism is an autocratic evil unleashed in America. It must be crushed. The danger is real. The threat is now. If you believe America is worth fighting for, join us. The Lincoln Project is responsible for the content of this advertising. Project is responsible for the content of this advertising.
The Lincoln Project is responsible for the content of this advertising. Donald, listen. Just listen. You know what's coming. You had to know. We were getting ready. Your legacy? For a big celebration. Yeah. Failure. It's over. And all of a sudden it was just called off. Your future? You fail. What future? Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will receive the most votes of any presidential ticket ever. Ouch. No legacy. Lawsuits. Lawsuits. Massive debts. Debt. Bankruptcy. Bankruptcy. Humiliation. Humiliation. Melania might not even stick around. No one wants a loser. Your house of cards has collapsed. It's over. Everything you've put off. Total collapse. Everything you've wanted to hide. Your secrets. All your secrets. They're all going to come out. You can't stop it. Can't you need to accept it. The former Vice President Joe Biden will become the 46th President of the United States. President Biden. It's over. You can't stop it. Biden won. He, he, he crushed you. Accept it. I'm the President of the United States. Don't ever talk to the President that way. No, sir. You can't tweet your way out of it. 400 tweets over the last two weeks are mostly false claims of fraud. You can't sue your way out of it. A dozen of the these lawsuits unsuccessful. Your lawyers are clowns, and your so-called allies won't save you. They were never going to. Do you have anything to say to the press? They won't save you. There's just one thing you could do to help yourself now. One small just thing. Just one thing. Get off Twitter. Get off Twitter. Put down your phone. And for the love of God, in the name of all that's holy, shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. Hey guys, hope you're doing well. Just watching my algorithms get crushed. I guess I did something to piss off the Instagram gods, so hopefully you're seeing this stuff anyway. We'll do what we can. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.